October 22 is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Adventist History Podcast, Season 2, Episode 21, Good Genes. Last time we discussed how the missionary death rate, along with the death of the pioneering generations of Adventists, created a conservative atmosphere in the Adventist church where those honored dead were revered and their traditions were to be preserved. This was also a time when Adventism was flushed with success, and all of this conspired together to produce, at least in one Michigan conference president, the notion that Adventism had peaked and should never henceforth change. In this episode, we're about to bite into a very solemn slice of Adventist history. And I want to begin with a question. How far would you go to improve the health of the human race? We tell our kids to eat their veggies. How far would you go to make sure that they did? How far would you go to make sure that people got vaccinated? How far would you go to make sure the person you're marrying wasn't carrying a latent genetic defect that could affect your future children. How far would you go? Would you ban all unhealthy food in America or wherever it is that you live? Would you force people to exercise? How far would you go to improve the health of the human race? Keep that question in the back of your mind as I shift gears here in our narrative time machine and take us back to Germany, 1923. Uh-oh. Adolf Hitler failed to take power. For his rebellion against the state, he served nine months in Landsberg prison. The warden of the prison openly admired Hitler, urging his other prisoners to be just like the scheming corporal. Apparently, treason is just politics by other means. Two weeks into his new home behind bars, the warden allowed Hitler to bring in a few dozen of his closest friends to celebrate Hitler's 35th birthday. It wasn't all fun and games, however. Hitler had to do real work, like how he spent some of his incarceration corresponding with a Munich car dealership trying to settle on which model of Mercedes-Benz he preferred. By the way, he settled on the 1140 model with its wicked top speed of 45 miles per hour. And then he asked the dealer for a discount. Owing to his unpaid court fines, because of his, you know, treason. When Hitler wasn't having parties in prison or haggling over a car, he was dictating his book, Mein Kampf, to two fellow prisoners who served as his secretaries. The book, of course, is a rambling mess if you've ever read it. It was a clumsy, apish attempt at producing a profound political philosophy. Probing the political fault lines of interwar Germany, Hitler marvels that an African can be made into a German citizen, for instance. He writes, quote, The president of the state can perform this piece of magic. What God himself could not do is achieved by some Theophrastus Paracelsus of a civil servant through a mere twirl of the hand. Nothing but a stroke of the pen and a Mongolian slave is forthwith turned into a real German, end quote. For Hitler... The political and ethnic value of what it meant to be German were inseparable. It was not a legal question. It was a genetic question. Hitler did look to one country in particular as a beacon of hope, as a model for the state that he wanted to create, America. Hitler wrote, quote, by refusing immigrants to enter there if they are in a bad state of health and by excluding certain races from the right to become naturalized as citizens, they have begun to introduce principles similar to those on which we wish to ground the people's state, end quote. After the Nazi party took power in 1933, prominent Nazi lawyers gathered together to make Hitler's ideals of immigration and citizenship a reality. They became known as the Nuremberg Laws. Jews, those of African descent, those of minor European ethnic communities like the Roma, were legally surrounded, 
Jewish doctors and lawyers became janitors. They were forbidden to have any romantic relationships with pure-blood Germans. If they tried to leave the country, they had to forfeit 90% of their wealth. Besides, other countries didn't exactly want them either. Months before the start of the Second World War, Cuba, Canada, and America turned away a ship of nearly a thousand Jewish refugees. If they allowed them in, wouldn't that just encourage more to follow? That's what Frederick Blair, Canada's immigration minister, reasoned. He said, quote, the line must be drawn somewhere, end quote. The two Nuremberg laws dealing specifically with the Jews addressed the two critical concerns, their status as citizens and who they were allowed to have sex with. Sex and citizenship, not coincidentally, was the concerns white Americans had about black Americans at this time. James Q. Whitman notes, quote, In the 1930s, Nazi Germany and the American South had the look, in the words of two Southern historians, of a mirror image. These were two unapologetically racist regimes, unmatched in their pitilessness, end quote. Now, the Nazi regime would certainly push their prejudice to extremes far beyond the southern United States, and that, in part, is what makes this truth particularly hard to swallow. We in the Allied nations have painted Nazi Germany as something of a pure evil, a nefandum, something that is too horrible to mention. And this has two positive effects for us. First, it allowed the Allies to justify firebombing German cities indiscriminately and to moralize the war as a clear case of good versus evil. Second, it soothes Allied consciences from having to wrestle with their own complicity. After all, guys, the Nazis didn't invent racism. As Whitman observes, quote, Nazism was not simply a nightmarish parenthesis in history that bore no relationship to what came before or after. There were examples and inspirations on which the Nazis drew, and American race law was prominent among them, end quote. At the heart of the Nuremberg Laws, was the desire to preserve the supposedly pure German genetic pool from what Hitler called racial pollution. Racial pollution, it turns out, was a popular concern for much of the Western world, including for Adventists, though they preferred to use phrases like race deterioration. It may seem strange to you that the leading scientists and doctors and clergy in the early 20th century, this age of flight and of automobiles and of electricity, commonly believed that human beings were getting physically worse, not better. John Harvey Kellogg had begun sounding the alarm in the 1880s, but it wasn't until the early 1900s that his fellow church members and society as a whole began echoing the same sentiments. Kellogg was by no means the most prominent voice in the eugenics movement that included the likes of John D. Rockefeller Jr., Alexander Graham Bell, and Teddy Roosevelt, and whose ideas were taught at Harvard and Berkeley. But it's impossible, I think, to tell the story of eugenics without mentioning him. He helped organize three race betterment conferences in Battle Creek between 1914 and 1928. Kellogg began his speech by saying, quote, We have wonderful new races of horses, cows, and pigs. Why should we not have a new and improved race of men? End quote. And that's probably the best way to define eugenics. The legacy of eugenics today is the idea that we should sterilize or even kill people who have some sort of genetic defect. That's not wrong, but you need to understand that at its core, eugenics was really a movement to apply modern genetic science to human health. It sounded exciting back then. It sounded cutting edge. Kellogg pointed out that a prize horse in 1818, by the way, trotted a mile in three minutes. In 1903, another horse did the same thing in two minutes. Which is to say, Kellogg's point is that in a hundred years, breeders had made a horse that was 50% better at that particular task. Think of what we could do if we started applying that kind of intentional development to human health. Kellogg had never been so excited. We possess enough knowledge, he said, to create a new race within a century. If the known principles of healthful living and scientific breeding were put into actual practice, Kellogg called for a new aristocracy of health, favorite slogan of his. 
Of course, we would need a eugenics registry office so that, in a statement that sounds rather dystopian today, he urged, quote, the whole population be brought under government medical supervision, end quote. Now, guys, this was not the work of some crackpot mad scientists, okay? The delegates to the first conference were affluent and influential. On the Central Committee, for instance, was the president of the American Medical Association, a former president of Harvard, several U.S. senators, and S.S. McClure, the man who modernized journalism. The delegate list reads like a who's who of the Midwestern and Eastern medical and social work establishment. On top of that, there were representatives from insurance companies, from the YMCA, from colleges like Tuskegee and the University of Chicago. Papers like the Chicago Tribune and Popular Science where they're not as press covering the event, but as contributors to this idea of eugenics. And of course, in attendance was David Paulson, the Adventist doctor, Kellogg's close friend, who founded the Hinsdale Sanitarium. Now, Paulson doesn't seem to have said much at the conference, at least we don't have a record of it, but perhaps he was just there to support his old friend. But what one wonders... What Paulson, a man who always wrestled with illness his entire life, thought when Harry Laughlin, perhaps the most prominent eugenicist of his day, proclaimed, quote, to purify the breeding stock of the race at all costs is the slogan of eugenics. The compulsory sterilization of certain degenerates is therefore designed as a eugenic agency, end quote. The logic isn't hard to follow. Modern civilization has introduced some destructive habits into human life. We smoke, we drink, we work in factories, we sit a lot, we live in dirty cities. Immigrants are carrying who knows what diseases over here. If we're going to survive as a human race, we need to fix all of this, just like we fix this in animals. We identify a goal, say, increasing the trotting speed of a horse, and we identify individuals who excel at that, individual specimens who excel at that, then we breed them, and we do it again and again and again. And in 100 years, we have a horse that can trot 50% faster. The flip side of that, of course, is that when we find individuals with deformed genes, genes that stunt their development or incline them, as they believed, towards crime or drugs and things like that, then we need to make sure that those people cannot procreate. We can't have them polluting the gene pool. We don't allow it with animals. Why would we allow it with humans? Are we not better than the animals? This seems like a good time to mention that another factor in this fear of race deterioration is, um, well, racism. Kellogg's friends Harry Laughlin and Madison Grant exalted the Nordic race as genetically superior humans by which they meant white Northern Europeans. Madison Grant's bestseller, The Passing of the Great Race, argued that the great human achievements were won by these Nordic white people and that they stood, and I quote, upon layer after layer of immigrants of lower races. His book was found on Hitler's bookshelf, and Hitler supposedly even wrote Grant a letter of appreciation for his work. In his own letter to Grant, Laughlin spoke of America's Jewish problem and that it was the job of the Nordic white people to, quote, prevent more of them from coming, end quote. He also, by the way, ranked Hindus from India higher than he ranked African Americans on his racial hierarchy. The leaders of this eugenics movement didn't create a public backlash against immigrants, but they helped steer it towards the 1924 Immigration Act. That act, together with a similar law passed in 1917, were really the first of their kind in America. America had never before set quotas for immigration. The idea America was aiming at with these laws was for the racial composition of the country to resemble what it did in 1890. So this 1924 Immigration Act said that America would accept as immigrants only... 2% of the U.S. population of a particular people group as of 1890. To put it in a less confusing way, there were 100 Italians in America in 1890. That is 100 people who were born in Italy who had moved to America. If there was 100 of them in America in 1890, 
then in 1924, America would only allow two Italians to immigrate from Italy, if that makes sense. Of course, if you were of English descent, this was no problem, right? And that was the point. It meant America wanted more Western European white Protestants and fewer Southern and Eastern Europeans, which they considered to be members of a lower race. And then, of course, there's Asians who uh, the great vast majority of them were completely banned. Even an officer of the Department of State explained that the purpose of the immigration law was to, quote, preserve the ideal U.S. homogeneity, end quote. This is the law, by the way, which Hitler was praising in Mein Kampf. The eugenicist Kellogg among them cheered. Kellogg himself avoided such explicitly racist terms. But then again, one didn't need to be explicitly racist to be understood. When he complained about the criminal classes in the big cities, the only places in America where white people were in a minority, it's not hard to see what he was getting at. And was it a coincidence that when he first began preaching about race deterioration, 14% of the U.S. population were foreign-born, which was the highest percentage of, of immigrants in U.S. history then and now? Americans had been mostly welcoming towards immigrants until the 1880s when Kellogg began voicing his concerns for the race, by which he meant especially the white race. But America's white Protestant majority fell from 66% of the population down to 50%, and that's when the red lights and the sirens began sounding. It wasn't just the immigrants that were the problem. It was where they were coming from. Is it a coincidence that just as immigrants began pouring in from non-white countries, remember, Italians and Poles were not considered white yet, Kellogg began worrying about the purity of the human race? Is it a coincidence that as those immigrants began heading for the big cities, people began worrying about crime in the big cities and talking about the need to sterilize criminals? You didn't need to be explicitly racist to be understood. During this eugenics movement, most U.S. states passed laws forbidding certain types of people to marry and requiring the forced sterilization of certain people, people like Carrie Buck. Carrie was apparently raped by her adopted family and became pregnant. When her mother found out, Carrie was committed to an institution as feeble-minded a eugenic code word as somebody who isn't fit to have children. See, said the eugenicist, her mother had kids out of wedlock. Now Carrie is having kids out of wedlock, even though she was adopted by a good and upstanding family. She just turned around and did the same thing. These people are just wired this way. We need to prevent them from procreating. And all in all, about 70,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized by these laws until they were repealed some of them, in the 1970s. So yeah, Nazi Germany is what happens when these eugenicists gain absolute power. And let's just say that panentheism wasn't John Harvey Kellogg's greatest heresy. Okay, so we've talked a lot about eugenics, not very much about Adventists, except for David Paulson. Eugenics takes some explaining because it's just it's something much of the Western world has wanted to forget about because Nazis... The Adventist reaction to the eugenics movement was interesting. Adventists largely rejected the eugenics movement as just another attempt by human beings to create a perfect society without God. Quote, It is believed that human salvation can be wrought out through eugenics. All this is false logic, F.M. Wilcox wrote. No one spoke louder than George McCready Price, though, who rejected eugenics because the very concept was coined by Darwin's cousin, and Price could smell a Darwinian plot from a mile away, even if it was buried in horse manure. The Price was right to see the connection. Kellogg and other leading eugenicists routinely called their plan artificial selection, as opposed to natural selection. They were conscious about being an evolutionary hand for humanity. But if Adventists rejected the movement, they nevertheless consciously or subconsciously imbibed the ideas and language of eugenics. Dr. Harry Miller, the superintendent of the Washington Sanitarium, used the first chapter of his new textbook on health to talk about race degeneracy. Referring to the unwell, Miller notes, quote, The preservation of the lives of these weaker members of the race means hereditary weaknesses 
in their posterity, which in time must greatly decrease the average length of life of the race, end quote. Published in 1920, when eugenic laws were already getting started, Miller spoke reassuringly that, quote, laws have already been enacted in 12 states of the Union to prevent the propagation of degenerate types of humanity, end quote. Just off the press, the Review and Herald told its readers about Harry Miller's new book, It's Only Two Dollars. John Harvey Kellogg couldn't have said it better himself. Speaking of Kellogg, when the man in the white suit held his third race betterment conference, Battle Creek 1928, two enterprising teachers from Emanuel Missionary College, now Andrews University, made the trip and took their students. A number of Avenus doctors, including Archie Truman, Harry Miller's successor at the Washington Sanitarium, either attended the Race Betterment Conference or got their hands on the transcripts of the lectures as soon as humanly possible. The Pacific Union Recorder, among many other Avenus papers, included a lengthy quote from S.S. McClure, that magazine maestro who attended the first Race Betterment Conference, where McClure warned, quote, the most important fact today is the coming struggle between the races of color and the white race, end quote. The Australian version of Signs of the Times picked up on McClure's theme and developed it, while reassuring their leaders that, quote, we do not take on the role of scaremonger, end quote, they nevertheless defended their role as scaremonger by arguing that they weren't the only ones who believe in, quote, the final clash for world supremacy between East and West, end quote. The Aussie Signs also added an article to their series, Warning of a Coming Conflict Between Jews and Gentiles. The Jews who were moving back to Palestine, one author warned, quote, invites another tragic chapter in the history of the Hebrews, end quote. Lyndon Skinner wrote in the wake of the 1924 Immigration Act that the, quote, Bureau of Immigration stands on guard against an influx of a horde of aliens whose presence in the United States might mean great menace to the welfare of its citizens. Here come strange figures with stranger gods and unknown rights, rich and poor, old and young, from lands overrun and overburdened with war, anarchy, famine, and debt, end quote. You notice he's not describing Western Europe there, right? Now, these latter quotes don't admit to an affection for eugenics per se, but what we see in the 19-teens and the 1920s is an awakening of race consciousness among white Adventists. They began looking at health, at politics, even spirituality through the lens of, of their white race. Among those getting some mileage out of McClure's warning of a global race war was Alonzo Baker. Baker was one of the young bucks, you might remember, who debated evolution with Maynard Shipley in San Francisco back in 1925. Now, Kevin Burton, a friend of this podcast, discovered that Baker was much more enthusiastic about the aims and goals of the eugenics movement than most Adventists let on. Baker served, for instance, as a field secretary for Kellogg's Race Betterment Foundation there towards the end. And Baker, like other eugenicists, was concerned about race suicide, which often meant the loss of a social majority for white people. According to Burton, he wrote, Quote, America in 2000 A.D. would find the Oriental and races other than the white race as threats to civilization, end quote. Of course, you won't find Baker making these comments in the review. No, he reserved these gumdrops of wisdom for the secular newspapers, and he spoke to these papers often. Now, the stuff that gets published in the Avenus Press could at most be considered sympathetic towards eugenics, but as with Kellogg, the references are often vague in terms of what the, what the author means when they're using certain terms. Leroy Froome, after scouring Kellogg in one of his books, nevertheless concludes with an ironic tone, writing, quote, However, Kellogg's wholesome emphasis on biologic living and race betterment never ceased as long as he lived. End quote. Kellogg's wholesome emphasis on race betterment? What exactly did Froome mean when he praised Kellogg's crusade for race betterment? What part of Kellogg's crusade was, was Froome approving of here? He just doesn't say. 
Eugenics promised to lend some scientific credibility to the Adventist themes of health, eschatology, and creation. Now, you didn't need to convince Adventists that humanity was degenerating. If Revelation was correct, that the final generation would polarize neatly between those who are loyal to God and to those who were who were loyal to the devil and who would pass Sunday laws and murder you if you didn't go along with it, then humanity had to be getting worse. It couldn't be getting better. Evanus also picked up on the idea of race degeneracy or race suicide because it seemed to be a powerful argument against evolution. Evolution means that we should be getting better, right? When it came to health, eugenics made even more sense. The renowned Adventist physician Daniel Kress repeated many of the eugenicists' arguments in an article for Signs of the Times. Kress explained that, quote, men living today are suffering the accumulated results of all their ancestors' bad habits and misuse of their bodies, end quote. And this is how Adventists and their eugenicist friends saw it. Make good health choices and you can change your genetic material, not just yours, but for generations of your children. If somebody who smokes all the time lives to be 95 years old, that's simply because his ancestors made really good health choices. And so his body was, was healthy and robust in spite of his own choices. But of course, generational abuse, generations of smoking people will, will end up resulting in offspring who will die early, even if they make the best, healthiest choices, right? So this is how they, how they looked at human health on, on a large genetic scale. Eugenics seemed to be an independent scientific confirmation of just how important the Adventist health message was. So it's curious that George McCready Price, who was not a medical doctor, seemed to be the only one who picked up on how untrue the idea of inheriting habits was. Acquired characters are not transmitted to offspring, Price wrote, echoing the work of Mendel. But Price was a prophet in the wilderness on this issue. An author in the Church's Health Journal wrote, quote, Preventative measures are not confined to the elimination of disease. Prevention of crime by educational and eugenic measures will gradually replace the old method of making criminals in order to punish them, end quote. That was a subtle nod towards forced sterilization. Crime was, to eugenesis, largely a genetic problem. Criminals give birth to criminals, then we punish them. So it's inhumane to allow this to continue this way. Sure, we will educate people so they won't commit as many crimes, but we also have to use those eugenic measures. All in all, it was rare for Adventists to support these eugenic measures, at least on the public page. They hardly mentioned sterilization at all. They did agree with eugenicists that the human race, and specifically the white race, was de degenerating, but not all went as far as Baker. They did agree that a change of lifestyle would do wonders for race betterment. Adventists began to develop their white race consciousness during the eugenic movement as well, and this is probably the biggest influence the eugenic movement had upon Adventism. Now, a lot more work needs to be done in this field, so if you're looking for a good master's topic or uh, dissertation topic, I would recommend this one. We're going to return to this topic a little bit when we get back to the 1930s in Germany. But first, we need to help out our man, W.W. Prescott, because it seems he's tangling with Judson Washburn for the last time. Oh, Washburn! We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.